Thank you very much to Mohammed actually for inviting me to give a, a talk today as part of this conference. And what he asked me to talk about was the history of the work that I've done and people have done in Leicester over the uh, last, I guess, uh, 15 years or so. And I thought that I would frame it in the context of the work that we're going to do. So we've just been awarded um, a bacteriophage research center. So this award has come from the university and it's through my department of genetics at the University of Leicester. We already have a center uh, for uh, cancer studies and for microbiology. So it'll be the third center, which means that there'll be a lot of um, a real focus of uh, research um, emphasis in this area. And it, I'll explain a little bit about that in my talk to you today. Um, so I'll, yeah, as I say, I'll introduce you to the center. And then I want to tell you about three projects that have really sort of led up to the center that I'm proposing. So I'm going to tell you work um, from my Clostridium difficile phages. I'll give you then some highlights on salmonella and urinary tract infections. So I decided when I was putting this together, I thought I can't possibly talk about all the things that we've done over this period. Um, there are many exciting projects that I've been lucky enough to be involved in, very often with people that specialize in a different system and I've provided, um, and people that work with me provided the phage expertise. But essentially in our center, we want to have three elements to the work. There will be a large element of, of isolation, building up banks of phages, studying the genomics. And then we have a massive focus on this area, which is to do really detailed um, characterization of phages, looking at how they work in different models, how they work independently and together. And then of course, that will hopefully lead to being able to get phages closer to being able to use them in people and animals. So there's a big element of this as well. So people involved directly in the center is myself, uh, Andy Millard, uh, Ed Galliov, Melissa Haynes, and Marie Noël Vetbeau. Uh, so Andy and I and Ed have all worked on phages for at least uh, 20 years. Uh, Andy is a, sort of brings in a lot of expertise, both in bioinformatics and in phage engineering. Ed has done a lot of work on pathogenicity. Melissa Haynes did a PhD in infectious diseases, uh, but then she did a medical degree. So she spends half the time in our phage center, which it is now, uh, and half the time in the hospitals actually treating patients. So she's a brilliant link between um, the actual phage research that we're doing and what's actually needed, what her clinical colleagues actually want. So she's leading the project on UTIs that I'll talk about. And then um, Marie Noël Vu is a public health doctor. So she spent a life sort of fixing crumbling infrastructures throughout the world that need healthcare, most recently London. <laughs> uh, so she's been really good at advising us what, where, where, where should we put our efforts as a phage community to, to be able to take things forward. So we have large collections of phages already to capitalize on. We also have, um, we already have some products that are fairly close to market, which we've uh, patented. We've got expertise in doing those more applied aspects. So I wanted to show you this little schematic, which sort of again shows what we will do, because at some level we're actually formalizing what we do anyway. So we have a nice team of, of postdoctoral researchers, PhD students. We have a, a very nice state-of-the-art lab for doing all phage work in. And Les is really nicely positioned because we actually already have, sorry about all these acronyms, I just thought I don't want to write them all out because it would make my slide even more cluttered. But essentially we have an Institute of Precision Medicine, an Institute of Structural and Chemistry Biology, a Mathematical Centre, and then a sort of Centre for Advanced Studies that does a lot of cultural work. So I've been looking, for example, at the, at the concept of viral fear. So the last thing we want to do is develop phage products and then people are scared to use them. They're sort of associated with like, like an anti-vax movement or anti-GMO. So we're looking at those aspects as well. We will get more resource such as space staff um, through this center. And the, the main aim as well is to work a lot more with our clinical collaborators, uh, both, well, both within Leicester who are very keen and also um, internationally. So we really want to do the, the fundamental work to underpin the development and act as a sort of center for critical, sort of critical mass to uh, do, do work ourselves and hopefully support other people that are interested in, in this topic. We already have pretty good collections for a number of species. We have a couple of thousand phages that target these um, organisms, uh, which we will, uh, which will, will, will sort of more formally store and curate these. But for these phages, we already have full genomic data and a lot of data looking at how they work in different model systems. 
And what I'm really, really interested in, in doing is really looking for sort of commonalities between different page groups. So I presented a talk last year at this meeting on um, an, for, and an ecological framework for pages. So I think at the moment, we tend to look at each page group quite individualistically. We don't look for overall trends into how, how we select pages and what are the attributes that make pages good for particular applied applications. So we, we normally select on virulence, host range, but perhaps uh, what I've been doing is repurposing ecological frameworks from botany to see if they work for, for plants, where, uh, sorry, for phages, where we can look at uh, how competitive they are, how good they are at coping with stress and disturbance. So that's a, another talk, but I've, I've uh, published that, those thoughts in, in the paper and page. Now, Andy started to collect all page genomes in about 2017. Uh, he eventually wrote up what he was doing, this made a searchable database, which means that anybody can, um, can, can search his database to look for uh, phage genomes. He published this in, in page then actually in 2000, or just last year. And he says that it's been cited about once a week. So that's uh, got uh, 22,000 phage genomes. So when we sequencing our new genomes, we have a very nice context of, of to how to look at the novelty and the similarities for other known genomes. We also have been developing tools. Now, Thomas is going to talk a lot more about this in his presentation, but we've been working a lot with both Thomas, uh, C. Bates Fontaine, and Bent Peterson at the Globe Institute in Copenhagen to develop tools to really help us uh, understand the genomic space of bacteriophages. So uh, I think uh, Thomas will expand on all these different tools, essentially tools to contextualize genomes, to be able to see where phages are most related to, to actually predict phages when there's no actual sequence similarity as well. And also we've been offering, um, Andy's done a lot of work offering training courses on how to annotate page genomes. So I wanted to say where it all started in terms of um, an interest of phages, both for myself and, uh, and Andy, because we actually met about 20 years ago. We had the same PI at Warwick and we were looking at cyanophages. And this was a time when people first realized just how abundant phages were. So that was just the first papers were coming out when people had started to look at uh, cyber green stain samples in the oceans and they realized there's perhaps 10 phages for every bacteria that exists. So you take a teaspoon of, of, uh, of seawater and you'll find uh, maybe 10 to the five uh, bacterial cells and a million phages in that sample. So this is the types of sampling um, I, I used to frequent, beautiful, uh, deserted Scottish beaches to study these viruses. And through studying them, we realized uh, just how integrated the biology was between bacteria and their phages. So for example, we were looking at the, the genome of a myovirus that infects uh, cyanobacteria. We found photosynthesis genes inside this genome and thought, well, gosh, what are they doing there? Is this a sequencing error? And realized, no, it's not at all. <laughs> and that these phages were full of actually genes that they've acquired from their cyanobacterial hosts that they were using to um, <coughs> promote infection. So Andy and I worked on different elements of this at, at Warwick before uh, moving on to work on different phage systems. But this definitely, um, in a way, illustrated to us the, 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 the complexity of the interactions between phages and their bacteria. So when I started my own group in 2007, I decided I would work on Clostridium difficile because there was very little done of phages that target this organism. I should have realized why the clue was in the name. <laughs> but when I moved to Leicester, we had really high rates. We had some of the highest rates of, um, of Clostridium difficile infection. So we spent a long time searching for phages, characterizing the prophages and, and looking for phages that target this organism. And a lot of this work was driven by Janet Mallow, who spoke earlier on um, today, who's largely my partner in crime for this um, adventure. So as I said, we decided to work on it because it's, it's the largest cause still of antibiotic associated diarrhea worldwide, and there are limited treatment options. It, sporulates this organism and has a very, very virulent toxins that cause this really nasty infectious diarrhea. So after a very, very long journey, which I don't have time to describe today, I essentially realized the best place to find phages was actually going back into the marine environment, into anaerobic salt marshes. And we pulled out a lot of viruses that target this organism. 
I should say that none of the viruses that we found are free from integrators. They all do have integrators, but um, being pragmatic, we, we characterized them. We found a set of phages that target all of the clinically relevant and prevalent species. We spent a long time developing different models to study these, these things. So looking at models in insects, artificial guts, epithelial cells, um, biofilms. This is about six years worth of some data on one, <laughs> on one slide. Well, not the data of, of, of the processes that we carried out. And there's just so much genomic diversity within these phages. If you look at this um, uh, analysis of the relatedness of genomes of C. difficile phages, those six that I told you that work really well are highlighted here with the red dots. Now, if there is a gene that's known and in common to these phages, that there's a red line, uh, sorry, green line going all the way up. So what you can, all I want you to see really is that if you take these six phages that I care about, very few of them have the same genes. So it's really how there's so much biology that's novel. We don't know how these things work. We don't even know how they um, infect. We don't know, well, um, understand the, the process of transcriptional hijacking of, of the phage. So we've been doing RNA sec to understand that. We have been doing um, work to identify the tail fibers. Again, they were not known. So we did work similar to the work that was presented yesterday, where we um, overexpressed putative proteins, raised antibodies, did um, assays to, to show that uh, we actually had the, the, we looked at uh, mopping up the phages with the antibody to show that we actually did have the, the tail fibers. You can see here, this is labeled um, with a secondary antibody. We can see we identified the tail fibers and it was a brand new protein. Uh, it then took a long time to actually get this protein structure using crystallography approaches. Uh, and then more recently with the, um, with the birth of AlphaFold 2, uh, look how good the prediction is. This is my, my structural um, collaborator, could not believe how good <laughs> this, uh, the, the green one is the, um, is the actual crystallographic data and the yellow one is the AlphaFold prediction. So I think there's going to be an awful lot of um, insights that we can get from looking at th this phage genome, it's based by, by moving in, into that structural, those structural predictions from AlphaFold. And Thomas will talk a bit more about that in his talk. So I wanted to summarize for the, again, this is probably for the, well, for the, the, the new researchers in the audience, um, my sort of summary of <laughs> seat of uh, phages, the trials and tribulations. So working on the system was, was, was very difficult because they were hard to find. We didn't find the phages that we were actually looking for. They're slow to work with, difficult to grow, clunky genetic systems. But everything we found was new. They're full of all sorts of, we found quorum sensing genes inside these um, pages. They do all sorts of things differently. Lots of, um, it's generated lots of projects um, as, as a result. And now we have the technologies to edit phages. There's potential to, to work with them and the products within them. And also I learned a lot of things about how to work with other quite difficult bacteria, because as we go forward, more and more bacteria that we want to find phages for are actually quite difficult to work with. So wanting to um, move a little bit faster, I, um, I decided I would work on, do some work within Salmonella, because I was approached by uh, the, the British pig levy board who had a lot of problems with salmonella within their pigs so whenever you start to work on a new phage system it's always there's always a little bit of um you have to learn that system really well and you have to also persuade a funding body that you you have this competency to, to start this new project and i think i got this funded due to the uh unlikely way in which I had to submit my grant, <laughs> which is if you see here, I was actually, I was teaching in Uganda and I had the idea where I just finished reading my grant on the airplane. I was submit it the next day and you know, I spent some weeks beforehand working on it. But then when I got to Uganda, there was no um, Wi-Fi anywhere uh, that I could use to submit my grant. So I had to go on the back of a Boda Boda. <laughs> this guy, look at how unimpressed he was at my <laughs> inability to balance on his bike. <laughs> ben, ben Chan actually took this from another Boda Boda. <laughs> Anyway, after about three hours of trogging through the uh, rush hour traffic in, um, in Kampala, I managed to buy a sort of dongle Wi-Fi package to submit my grant. So I think I got it due to the sheer <laughs> karma of persevering the submission with the submission process. Anyway, so we moved to, to work in the system. And I wanted actually just to show you um, one data set in a little bit of detail, because I think uh, the data that we've got from this project it answers lots of really quite important um, fundamental questions that we don't really understand at the moment, uh, which is what is the 
how, how should you dose? If you're giving phages to a, to, a, to a human or an animal, how many phages should you, should you give and, and when? And chickens are actually a very useful thing to actually work on because they're incredibly genetically similar. So you eliminate a lot of variation in terms of the generation data and you can use really large sample sizes. So first of all, we, we found lots of um, phages that worked well on our strains. There are very interesting phenotypes actually associated with some of these viruses. Some of them are heat stable. So most viruses, if you heat them up, they will just fall apart. Uh, some of these viruses were stable even at 80 degrees when they're heated for an hour, which is useful because it means they can be formulated through the feeding process. So if you want to impregnate your feed with a, with a phage, the, the feed gets heated up to quite high temperatures. So this was rather useful. So we showed that we could we could dry these phages. Um, oh yeah, we, so we have looked at this. We had to. This is a laboratory uh, spray dryer. And then this was um, the industrial spray dryer that we used for our first trial, our pig trial. We embedded the phages within the feed. And if you just look at the um, intestines within the pigs, that the first trial we did was on pigs, uh, you can see that the animals that had phages just had, had far less swollen uh, intestines. Uh, and they had also a lot more, I'll just take it off that picture because it's pretty horrible. Uh, <laughs> they had a lot more, um, the, the rate of colonization with salmonella was far lower following the salmonella um, phages. I should just say, actually, that work has just been published. Uh, Janet mentioned it this morning, actually, in her talk as well. So that, that, that's all, all the data from that trial was recently published in Microbiology Spectrum. But the, the trial that we've just been examining, we've done, I think, three trials in salmonella and um, some other animal trials as well. And we, this particular trial I'll, I'll sh share with you was looking to see if we could use phages to reduce colonization and shedding in challenge spreads. And we used three different doses of phages, 10 to the five PFU per liter, 10 to the six and 10 to the seven. And we had really nice sample sizes. So we had six treatment groups and in each treatment group, we had 112 birds. So we had a control that had nothing. We had uh, birds that had the, the phages, birds that just had the salmonella, and um, then we also had the salmonella challenge with the three different doses of phages. And these chickens get, we, uh, chickens in the UK are kept for 42 days. They have three different diets within that period. So the phages were impregnated in all the different feet. This was the, the, the study. We challenged the birds um, at day four, and then we sampled on those days in red. I'll just show you some of this data now. Um, this is looking at the shedding of salmonella from the birds with dosage. So if you remember, um, T3, would just they had the salmonella, and then this is the, the shedding rates in terms of colony forming units per gram of feces. So this is the 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, and 10 to the 7. So the higher doses of phages worked faster. So at day 14, you could see a significant lowering. But actually, you can see that with all three doses of phages, we, uh, we did see a significant reduction in the amount of bacteria uh, but that were being shed from the birds and actually at the lowest dosage there was there were no some we could not identify any salmonella from those birds when we looked to see um, how many pens we could find salmonella from so this is called the sock assay they walk around the pens with special socks and uh, go look for uh, salmonella on the on, on on these and again the lower you can see here from those pens there were the lowest doses of phages we did not find salmonella at all and there was a significant difference on those uh, with all the phage treatment groups. And the other thing we got from this trial was the fact that the phages clearly do replicate within the gut of the chicken during the administration. So if you compare the animals that just had phages and did not have bacteria, that's in black, uh, the, the, and to, the, to all of the three different dosage of phages, we can see that um, the phages were clearly replicating. So I think uh, certainly the people that we've worked with, so this trial was designed um, by uh, the, the feed company that we work with, AB Agri, they're based in Peterborough. So the trial was designed by so about 16 people who, who just, that's what they, you know, they, they've designed trials to look at an, a large number of different types of additives. So it's really interesting working with them to see how they actually designed that element of it. So the summary from that data was the fact that phages are, um, they, 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 they were highly effective. Um, the higher dose worked um, more quickly but the lower dose eradicated salmonella. And actually, I didn't show you the data, but the, the phages also improved the what's known as the feed conversion ratio. So those animals did much better in terms of their overall performance. So I'm going to spend three minutes just telling you about the, the, what we've been doing over the last few years in urinary tract infections, because in a way, we're bringing things we've learned from the different systems together to this 
setting because urinary tract infections are just so um, like a massive cause of morbidity and mortality and they lead to bloodstream infections. So the two bacteria of interest are Klebsiella pneumonia and E. coli. And actually, if you look at the overall rates of bloodstream infections, about 50% of them are thought to come from um, urinary tract infections. And the, the, they're really high compared, and if you look at deaths per year in the UK here, which is per, this is um, death per thousand, uh, in, in terms of thousands of, of people, compared to things that we think are the major, well, are major killers as well, different cancers. So it's a major, major problem. So that's what we've been focusing on with Melissa Haynes, who I mentioned. So the three parts to this project are to build up a big collection of pages that target those bugs. So we've done that. We've got a big collection of all the extended beta-lactamase strains of both E. coli and uh, Klebsiella that come from patients throughout the UK. And then Mel has been working with Marie Noel to do the sort of um, assessment of stakeholder, the qualitative research. So working with the regulatory bodies, with the clinicians to work out how we will roll out a trial in this setting. And then the thing that we need, the data we need to, to gather before we can do a trial is the safety data in an animal model. So we've just started to do this uh, work. We've got the, uh, um, a model that mimics how we would use the phages. So we would use the phages in humans and we'd catheterize them directly into the bladder. So we have a model that mimics that. The um, mice have the phages injected directly into their bladder. So we're just about to do this to, to look at both sa safety and efficacy and do the appropriate histology. And we also have another way that using our knowledge of developing models, uh, another model that we're doing, my PhD student Karen has set up, is using um, an artificial bladder shown here. And what we do is for this project is we get catheters, because um, one of the major, uh, old elderly people who um, have catheters, get, those catheters get infected with Klebsiella and E. coli, and, and they have horrible biofilms inside there. So um, we're looking at how our phages will work in, in this natural setting as well by getting these actual catheters. Finally managed to get ethical approval to get these catheters from patients. And then uh, um, Karen will be running the phages through in the system. So just to, to finish my, um, my talk, I want to, hopefully I've shown you what we're setting up in Leicester and why. And uh, the, the idea is that we'll have accessible banks of pages that people can access. So when people want to start a project, they don't need to, everyone doesn't need to just scrabble around and spend a, a year on finding pages. When we've all got saved pages that, that we've, the people have developed over the years. So we hopefully that people, we will invite people to deposit their pages within our collection so they can be made accessible and available for the research community at large. Uh, we want to have a, a sound understanding of those phages, both their biology uh, and their, their genomes. So we hope that this will really accelerate the, the bench to bedside development of, of this, both within medicine and, with, and agriculture. So essentially, we hope to be able to provide the sort of fundamental underpinning to develop phage products and reduce AMR. We've got, um, so we're hoping, as I said, there's lots of centers within Leicester that we're working with, but we, hopefully will provide us this critical mass for the research community at large. So before I finish my talk, um, I just want to say a tiny bit about the Phage Journal. Hopefully some of you have picked up copies of Phage Journal. We, we brought some, um, this journal was oh, sorry, extremely important acknowledgements. <laughs> um, yeah, that's so Janet showed this picture earlier on. It's the, the recent picture of our lab uh, at Leicester. Yeah, so a lot of people, and a lot of funding went into this, uh, into the data that I uh, presented to you today. Um, so the, um, the phage journal, what we hope to do with this journal, I think it should become a, a journal that's a really supportive journal for, for members of the phage community. Marianne Leavitt is quite a small publishing house and they really, uh, they tend to, all of you look at the profile of their journals, they identify communities that don't really have a, a clear, obvious one space where they can put, um, publish, and they try to provide that. The other journals that we have are really uh, interesting and they've been great to, to work with so far. We la launched a journal in 2019 so it was not the easiest of time to get a, a new journal going. We have both special issues. Um, so there's a really brilliant issue we have out there on the historical aspects of phages. Um, we also have had a, this next issue is going to be on um, phage transcriptional takeover. That was edited largely by Debbie Hinton and Paul Turner. So that should be a great issue as well. Um, 
we've just been accepted for um, indexing. So at the moment, when you launch a journal, it takes a while to get your all of the um, things to, to, so that the journal can be indexed, so you then can get an impact factor. But we've now been accepted for indexing in the, the usual places, which is great. Uh, we've published on a whole range of different um, aspects to do with bacteriophages. And we, we, so we invite people to publish in, in this journal. It's a quick reviewing process. Um, and um, it, the, the work gets a lot of interest and, and notice. So it should be a, a really nice, a valuable tool for us as a community. And if people want to look at the content for free for the next 60 days, um, they've made this, um, you can, you just take a note of this, you can put in pages 60 and you can then for the next 60 days see all the content for free to get a feel for what it is like. And with that, I will end my, my talk and uh, happily invite any questions. Thank you. Uh, hi, Emma again from Folium Science. Thank you for this talk. It was very interesting. I was curious, um, based off of your experience, what, if you were to design an experiment where within those three different periods of dosing mm -hmm. your chickens, if you had changed the uh, concentration of phages, would you start low earlier on in the life uh, or at the first dosage? and then aim for higher because of that faster uh, eradicate or the faster uh, killing, but not the full eradication that you saw with the lower dosages? Or do you think that keeping it consistent would be more beneficial than mixing it up? Yeah, we've done a few things. That's a, a very good question. We've done a few things since this trial to, to look further at the dosage. And because the low dose worked so, so well, we've actually been we've gone even lower. We've also done experiments where we've just fed them just at the grower feed and then just at the final feed as well to, to really try and try and look at that. So that's what's been really nice actually working with, um, with, with people that design design trials for additives. So they immediately, they, can get, they get the data on one trial to immediately inform the other one and the other one. So we've just, we haven't, uh, that trial literally only just finished about a week ago. So we haven't um, finished, we haven't analyzed all the data, but it'll be really interesting to see how that's done. There's a question online from Mohammed Imam. Yes, hi. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Martha, for this very nice presentation as usual. Uh, as as maybe most of you know, I'm, I'm, I was very lucky to be uh, Martha's PhD student uh, a few years ago and uh, uh, to get much supervision, uh, very good supervision from here. And yeah, my question is uh, about this center and uh, how soon is this center will uh, receive like uh, or or uh, patients for phage therapy. I mean, if not for complete phage therapy, at least for compassionate uh, use phage therapy, like, like what we can uh, see in some centers uh, in America. And uh, in general, how soon is this going, going to be uh, accepted and approved? Because uh, when, from when I started like looking for phages and getting interested in phages, uh, I hear this word, which is, uh, it is under approval uh, from the global uh, scientists and global uh, health authorities. But till now, I, 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 um, it is uh, the progress of this approval, I think it's taking longer than I, I was expecting, at least. Uh, these are my two questions, and thank you. Okay, no, thank you. No, we were... Um... We're very lucky to have you as a PhD student, I would say. But, <laughs> but no, but nice, very nice question. So in terms of the centre, um, we, we have, it has what's currently called a soft launch, <laughs> and then the, so we'll have a, a, a hard, a hard formal launch of the centre. I think in October, if the, um, my pro VC told me recently. Uh, but the what what we are hoping to do with it is work a lot more with our clinical partners. But it's to really do that fundamental. Uh, that fundamental research. So some of the emphasis of the centers in the States has been to immediately start using things in patients. That's not how I think we will proceed here. It's much more to do the careful, um, the, the, the careful science and pro provide um, data. But what's really interesting shift in terms of 
clinical interest. So when I started the group in 2007, really none of my clinical colleagues were interested at all. But now the two main um, physicians who are in charge of respiratory health for our trust, well actually three, one COPD and two different TB, are really interested in, in doing work to take phage work forward in the context both of, of trials and compassionate work. So I think as we've got the centre, it'll give us extra resources to be able to collect data to be, work more formally within, within those structures. So um, I hope that a little bit addresses that. And then also at the moment, the president of the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, David Jenkins, he's actually based at Leicester. So he's our doctor in charge of infectious disease. So he's really keen to, to really um, help play a role in pushing this fundamental science. So that's that. What was, sorry, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> The second part is the for the global actually uh, acceptance or approval yes. of yeah uh, okay. yeah yeah I mean I hope hopefully that, that, I think I think with more momentum in a lot, lot of different places throughout the world and um, people are looking at a, a lot of the bottlenecks so for example production um, regulation gathering different data so I think I I, I, I still think there's a, there's there's still a, a, a lot of this, a lot of data to to be gathered. I think there's going to be, and people pe people often we, when we've had it alluded to at this meeting, there's clearly a need for people who who you know terribly sick now. They need something now, and then there's also to fit in with um, existing medical infrastructures. You, you you know we have we have to do trials of some sort. I think otherwise, um, you don't have something that's accessible in, in a mainstream fashion. So I think both both strands of phage research are being well are being developed and resourced and, and, and taken forward in different ways. I, I think there's a clear role for both of those. Um, and I, I, I think that as more countries start doing different things when, when globally, because our countries look to each other, don't they? There's really exciting things happening at the moment in Australia. There's some centers in the States that are doing good things. Georgia, of course, uh, um, had this wonderfully long history and a lot of things to draw on as well. So I think as bits come, come together, um, pe people do more than I think there's definitely, definitely an overall global critical mass that is gathering. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mars. I'm looking for collaboration soon. So. Hi, Martha. Thanks for the wonderful talk. I was actually wondering again about the center. And you mentioned about the Advanced Science Institute, I guess, uh, which will be focusing on anxious, anxiousness towards page therapy or all that sort of stuff. So, um, do you know? whether this institute will be focusing more on citizen science or public participation projects then and may sort of feed back into uh, the fundamental science, for instance, co-designing research questions. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we'd like to have, we'd like to build into the center, for example, a doctoral training program focusing on phages, but, um, and hopefully we can combine other efforts uh, that, that, the, the, to, on sort of more of a sort of citizen science thing, so, but, but there's no reason why it's collection should, we can store or share collections. Um, the, 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 I, th the, I think the real focus with the center will be to, to, to try to, to, try to <laughs> make sense of the genomes, try to, try to, because I mean, when, when page therapy was first looked at, we were doing everything blind. We don't need to do things blind anymore. We can actually, so we can actually look for patterns and commonalities, and so that it's going to be more the sort of uh, fundamental biology aspects that we're hoping to fix on at, uh, with, with a lot of these models that we've been developing. Great, thank you. Hello, uh, Nina Molin Holland Korsbo from the University of Copenhagen. I'm really curious about the UTI phage therapy approach and whether there's a difference in the bacterial susceptibility to the phages, whether or not they're grown in urine with a normal glucose level or with a high glucose level from uh, simulating a diabetes patient. Yeah, um, we haven't looked at that directly, but I'm, I'm quite I'm quite sure that there are. Well, that's one of the reasons why we developed that artificial bladder so we can actually look at the dynamics in um, in urine. In lots of other systems we've been looking at, we've done a lot of work looking at um, how phages and bacteria interact with with temperature, with oxygen status, uh, and I, I think in 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 general. It's, it's clear just growing things <laughs> in a standard way in, in, the, in, the, in flasks is not mimicking how you'd need to use them. So yeah, we're very keen to try to understand those dynamics and look at the actual that sort of human host environment that, that they're interacting in. Yeah, very good point. Okay, I think we're done.
those uh, last questions. Let's thank uh, Martha and uh, all the speakers of this session.